Well, here we are, my friends. And, um, you know, this is the first time that I've actually given this talk in a while. Because as you know, um, I've been really, really pushing St. Joseph for the last year, for sure. But even two years prior to that, um, so I haven't given this particular talk in almost three years. So I'm excited to, to, to give it again because I used to give this talk all around the world. And um, I love giving this talk, especially to men's conferences. Now, I know there are ladies here present, so I'll, no, I'm not going to hold back. <laughs> um, ladies, you'll just have to deal with it. Because um, we as men, we need to hear certain things, right? And there would be certain times when it would be inappropriate for a priest like myself at a Sunday mass where women and children are present to say some of the things that I'm probably going to say today. You know, the bishop would probably be getting a phone call and I'd be going away to priest camp you know, for sensitivity training because, you know, Father, that wasn't the right context. Okay, I get it, right? But this is, so get ready. All right. So you guys see me holding a rosary here. Right? And um, this is an awesome rosary, by the way. It's the St. Joseph Terror of Demons rosary. Now, yeah, super, super cool. Very masculine rosary. It is a weapon, right? It will do some damage to you, literally. Um, you see me holding it, and uh, you, know, you, 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 you know what it is. It's, it's a beaded prayer. Now, to look at it physically, it doesn't look intimidating. You wouldn't look at this and go, ooh, that's gonna do some damage, right? They break in your pocket. As a matter of fact, mine right now is trying for the last 20 minutes to untangle it. It's tangled up. It'll eventually get the Our Lady of Undoer of Knots, right? Um, so it doesn't look intimidating. They break. It's, it's a physical thing. But see, what you and I can't see, but God can, and Our Lady can, and the angels can, both the holy ones and the fallen ones, is that what I'm holding in my hand right now is a sword, a spiritual weapon that slays dragons. But see, we can't see that. But in the spiritual realm, that's what it is. Now that's, that's, that's very militant language, right? Some people will be turned off by that. I've even heard priests say, oh, prayer is not a weapon. Like who trained you, homie? You're talking about prayer is not a weapon. I mean, what formation did you, this is that's ridiculous right i had to be so careful on social media oh man pray for me because i write things and i'm like mm, i'm about to press send and i'm like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna get a call from somebody right so i'm like oh, i want to pray for this sorry soul because he's lost you know so i hear this stuff and i'm like what are you talking about prayer is not a weapon what are you talking about the rosary is not a weapon so if you don't you might think okay well this is father calloway we listen to his story he's pretty aggressive kind of scary sometimes with his, you know, just real, you know, militant approach to things. All right, fine. Let's take it out of the realm of Father Calloway. And let me give you some examples. There's a bishop alive still in Nigeria, Bishop Dome. Um, you can watch the video, you can Google this later to back it up. A few years ago, when I was writing a book called Champions of the Rosary, I heard a story about this bishop in Nigeria where you know about Boko Haram, right? One of those really radical Islamic groups that does horrible things to people, kidnaps girls, does horrible things, and then sells them to others to do horrible things. Wicked dudes, man. So in his diocese, a whole bunch of dioceses in Nigeria, 700 girls, you might remember this from a few years back, had been kidnapped from a school. 700 girls by Boko Haram. And people were coming to the bishop and they were saying, Bishop, what do we do? Lead us. Tell us we're freaking out here. Our daughters have been taken captive. What are we supposed to do? And he wasn't sure. So he went to prayer before the Blessed Sacrament in his, his private chapel. And he was praying the rosary, asking for heavenly assistance. And then he testifies. A bishop, he's not lying. And you can watch the videos. He's still alive. He says that in prayer, all of a sudden, Jesus appeared to him. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our sweet Jesus appeared to him. And guess what Jesus had in his hands? Anybody want to throw out a word? No. Ha, gotcha. Suckers. No, that's good. You should have said that. Correct. But that's not the right answer. Jesus had a sword. A sword in his hands. Now to modern liberals, that will freak them out. They'll be triggered like you don't even, you know. Jesus had a sword. What's up with that? That's not normal. Well, then he was in the nights. Yeah, maybe, maybe. He is the knight. <laughs> so 
There's our Lord with the sword. The bishop is startled by this. And Jesus doesn't say anything, but he gestures to the bishop to come near him. And Jesus ha hands the sword like this. The bishop goes to touch, take the sword, because that's what Jesus is implying. He touches the sword. Then your answer is correct. It mystically transforms into a rosary. I'm not making this up, guys. And then Jesus speaks to his bishop. And he says to him three times, Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. The bishop said that he didn't need a prophet to tell him what that meant. It meant you need to take up this spiritual weapon against this darkness to overcome them. So he started a rosary crusade in his particular diocese. You know, shortly after that, almost all of those girls, some of them didn't make it, almost all of them were returned. No one asked Boko Haram to do this. Then they handed in their weapons to the authorities. Look it up. And then the president of Nigeria went on the radio and said, we don't know what's going on here. What, 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 what happened? Well, the bishop knew. And the people that, that were in his parishes knew. It was this, this spiritual weapon. It's serious stuff. This is the Bible on a set of beads, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to cut through bone and marrow and slay dragons. That's what this is. Now, let's, let's back up maybe 100 years. We're going to do a lot of history here. 100 years ago, another example. There was a guy in Italy named Bartolo Longo. I don't know if you know about this dude's story. Phenomenal. Catholic, raised Catholic, right, from Naples area. But he went off to college and, like sadly happens to many, he lost the faith. And at that time, 100 years ago, there were a lot of movements in Italy who were, you know, really trying to debunk Christianity and say, that's just old legends and, you know, wives' tales and stuff like that. And the rosary, that's nonsense. That's for the weak. And so he got s caught up in that and he abandoned Catholicism. But he was still searching and he got involved in what today we would call New Age. Back then, 100 years ago, it was called like spiritism. And he went to like seances and all kind of weird stuff. And he felt empowered there, right? He felt acknowledged. He felt like part of a community. He got so involved in it, in his own words, not Father Calloway's saying this for emphasis, nope. He was ordained a satanic priest, Bartolo Longo. You can't get farther away from God than that. Those of you who know my story, I was a wicked dude, but I didn't worship the devil, you know? Bartolo did. And what was the fruit of that? Depression, thoughts of suicide, on medications. You know, he was having hallucinations, all kind of crazy stuff. Almost ruined him mentally. He broke down, humbled himself. And after a long period of time, he went and talked to a Dominican priest. That's huge. And that Dominican priest told him, Bartolo, your way out of this cult, your way out of this is the rosary. This is what's gonna set you free. This is what's going to bring you back to the sacraments and to the truth. And he embraced it. He became a third order Dominican, Brother Rosario, and built what is today the world's most famous shrine dedicated to the rosary. Our Lady of the Rosary of Pompeii. Unbelievable basilica. I've been there. Man, that's what a church should look like right there, my friends. Gorgeous. Absolutely beautiful. And now that man, a former satanic priest, is blessed Bartolo Longo. He's a blessed of the church. That's amazing. So, you know, I meet a lot of people today, especially men, who they'll say to me when I'm in a parish or at a prayer group or at a men's group or whatever, and they'll say, eh, you know, Father, I know you plug the rosary, you got a whole bunch of books on it. That's cool, that's cool. But, you know, that's for my wife. That's what my wife does. And I'm like, oh, okay, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Or, you know, I've heard people say, that's what grandma does. That's what a nun does. And I'm like, bro, you do realize that the person that Our Lady gave the rosary to was a dude. It wasn't a woman. It wasn't a nun in the convent. It wasn't grandma. It was a man in the 13th century, a priest, Dominic. At that time, Father Dominic, who was a great speaker. Oh man, that guy was an orator. He could speak, he could go, he could rouse people up for sure. But there was a heresy at the time, Albigensianism, from this town called Albi in southern France. And they were basically attacking the incarnational mysteries of Christianity. The flesh, God become man. What is this? The Eucharist, the body of Christ. 
They were attacking those things and advocating all kind of crazy ideas. So this priest, zealous, he got permission from his bishop to go start preaching because he was just basically like a diocesan priest at the time. And he tried, but it didn't work. So he went on a retreat in a field in France and he begged heaven for, for help. And that's when tradition says, not a legend, not a fairy tale. I hate that garbage when they call it this stuff. Tradition says that our lady came to him and she gave him the rosary and she used battle language about it. Oh yes, it's spiritual roses. This is true. But from the beginning, she said it is a weapon to be used to win souls back to the light. And she equipped it with mysteries and she sent him out. She said, preach it. And he did. And he won back so many souls. And the mysteries that he was given were the exact mysteries that the heretics were attacking. We'll get more into that later about why we might need to reload the weapon today with additional mysteries because of certain things that are being attacked. Like 69% of Catholics don't believe in the real presence. It makes a lot of sense that the Holy Spirit would, would give us a mystery, the institution of the Eucharist. I'll get more into that as we go through this. See, she gave him this weapon and he went out and he used it. And he unsheathed the sword. You know, it wasn't official at that time, it is now, but many of the mendicant orders at that time began to wear this sword on their habit as part of their religious attire. And do you know where they wore it? On which side? The left. The left. Why? Just random? Let's roll dice. Yeah, the left. You know, flip coin. No. Why? Because most people are right-handed. Not everybody, but most. And when you unsheathe your sword, you take your right hand to your left side and you take it out. That's why when you look at Dominicans today, most religious communities, it's on the left and not the right. The rosary was made in a time of chivalry, of knights and battle. Everybody knew this back then, right? You're talking about it's not a weapon. Where you been? What horrible seminary you go to? It's your formation in history. This is nonsense. Of course it is. This is terminology used by Our Lady time and time again, and even by popes. Nonsense. I, some Franciscan on the internet says, oh, it's not, a, Pope would never talk like this. Buddy, I did three years of research. I got all the quotes from popes in my book where they're talking about this rosary as a weapon. You're hot. Where you been? Right? Well, all you gotta do is look and see where they went to seminary. You'll find out, right? <laughs> So let's back up. When Our Lady gave the rosary to St. Dominic, a man, to champion it, you know, the devil did not like this. Mm -mm. Now prayer was portable, you could say. You didn't have to know Latin. You didn't have to be a scholar. You didn't have to be skilled orator. You didn't even have to know how to read and write any language. Grandma could do this. A child can do this. It's Catholicism 101. If you can say an Our Father and a Hail Mary and a Glory Be, you're in. Who can't do this? And so it became, everywhere became basically a chapel. Everybody could make a pilgrimage on a daily basis, no matter where they were. Many people at that time, they couldn't go to the Holy Land or to other places. But God, through Our Lady, gave everybody the availability to do an incredible prayer on a daily basis that would transform your life and society. And the devil did not like this. So since the early 13th century, when Our Lady gave this weapon to the world through St. Dominic, there's been a battle raging over it. God wants to put it in your hands and the devil wants to strip it out. Why? Nobody slays a dragon without a sword. Nobody. It's interesting. I don't have time to go into this. But you know, at the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, what did God put there? A sword. Interesting, no? Mm -hmm. Very interesting, I think. I actually talk about that in more depth in my book, Champions of the Rosary. What that could mean, some possible interpretations and so forth. Just my thoughts, but it's fascinating. What happened right after St. Dominic was given this? And it started to spread everywhere because he founded an association of prayer to go with it. It wasn't yet called the Confraternity of the Rosary, but it was an association of prayer. 
The devil came in to try and eliminate this because he always does, man. When, when God gives a weapon to the world to combat evil, the devil tries to do many things to it. Destroy it, burn documents associated with it. If you're familiar with the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, for example, just as one example among many, you know, the original diary of St. Faustina, the devil tricked St. Faustina into burning it. It's of no use appearing as an angel of light to her, tricked her into burning it. This, I could tell you so many stories about the, these things that have happened throughout history. So what happened in Europe? A plague, the Black Plague. One third of Europe died, my friends. Millions of people died. Yes, it was because of a, a natural cause, you know, rats infested and so forth. Yes, for sure. On that level, nobody denies this. But on the spiritual level, don't take my word for it. Years later, a great man, St. Louis de Montfort, in the greatest book ever written on the rosary, The Secret of the Rosary, says that the Black Plague in the 14th century was the devil's way of trying to get rid of the weapon. Eliminate it. And it almost worked. People stopped praying the rosary during the Black Plague. Though it was during the Black Plague that we got the second half of the Hail Mary. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. That's the only prayer of the rosary that's not right in the scriptures. It came out of the Black Plague era because people were, thought they were going to die. So the devil almost succeeded. Not many people were praying the rosary. They were worried about surviving the Black Death. After that, in the 14th century, in the, in the early 15th century, after the Black Plague was you know, going away, a renewal movement happened in the church called the, the Observant Reform Movement. It happened in the Franciscans, it happened in the Carmelites, it happened in, 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 in the Dominicans, many communities. And many of them started to have their own form of a rosary. You had the Franciscan Corona Rosary, you had the Brigitine Rosary, all different, the Servite Rosary, the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady. But what about the original, the Dominican Rosary? Well, there was a man, blessed uh, Alan de la Roche. See, I haven't given this talk in three years, so I gotta remember this stuff. Blessed Alan de la Roche, a Dominican, scholars, right? Dominicans, awesome, those guys, nobody can touch those guys intellectually. When you get a good Dominican, watch out. Okay, watch out. So he was into his books, as they do. It's like a sacrament for them. Jesus appeared to him, and I love this, I love this. Jesus appeared to his Dominican and said to him this, and this sounds harsh to us, right, today. We're like, dang, that's brutal. But this is what Jesus said to his Dominican priest. The world is filled with ravenous wolves, and you unfaithful dog know not how to bark. Dang! That's brutal, right? Jesus ain't a guru, he's God. If you're rebuked from God in that way, wow. I would hate to be on the receiving end of that. Why would he call him a brutal dog or, or an unfaithful dog? See, when the Dominicans were founded by St. Dominic, he didn't call them the Dominicans, they were the order of preachers. But they became known as the Dominicans because of his name. But in Latin, the word Dominicanis means dogs of God. They go with the torch throughout the world with truth to get rid of it. They sniff it out and they get rid of it. That's the Dominicans, the dogs of God. So he was saying to a Dominican, you're an unfaithful dog. You're not barking. Well, after that rebuke, he kicked it in gear and he began to promote the rosary, renew the Dominican rosary and he renewed the confraternity. Kings were joining the confraternity of the rosary. It was unbelievable what was happening. God did that through a priest. That play between God and the devil here, so to speak, throughout history with this battle weapon. What happened after that in the next century? The devil used a priest to attack the rosary, to go after it, to say it was nonsense. It was a legend. There's that word again. It was a legend. Prayed for no one to gain nothing. Do you know who this man was? Father Martin Luther. The founder of Protestantism is a fallen away Catholic priest. Do you know this? See, today people want to just whitewash history and be like, yeah, yeah, no, just, mm. no, this is reality. I'm not some meanie up here, you know, I'm telling you the facts. The dude was sick. 
If I told you the things that he said about women and Jewish people, you would be scandalized by who this man was. And you know, there's a book today still in existence at the, the University of Jena in Germany that was his book about the rosary confraternity. And in the margins affirmed his handwriting, he slammed it, called it a legend, indulgences, stupid, and gained for no one purgatory. What is this? Still in existence. Wow. What was the effect of that? Many people followed him and others who came after him and followed his ideas and went their own direction with it and ditched the rosary, put the sword on the shelf. Not good. Not good at all. What was God's response to that? Because, you know, millions of people were leaving the one true church founded by Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church in Europe. What did God do? God said, all right, you don't want it? Fine. God sent Our Lady to a little unknown dude in Mexico named Juan Diego and basically gave him an unattached rosary with a tilma with roses on it to lay before the bishop and fill in the gap of those millions of people who had left Catholicism in Europe. Like 10 million people in a decade became Catholic in Mexico. Wow. Wow. And incredible things happened in the 16th century when all this was happening. The great missionaries went out to the ends of the earth. You had Jesuits, right, going to India. You, you had Dominicans and Franciscans in South America. And what did they do when they, when they went on the rickety ships to India? Did they take liturgical tomes and all these things to read to the natives in Latin? No. What did all of them take with them, usually strapped to their side? A rosary. The rosary evangelized the world. It's so basic, it's so simple. It's the springboard for going deeper, for introducing them to the sacraments. It's a sacramental. It points to grace, sanctifying grace. That's what all of them did, every single group that went out to the world. And it worked, and it worked. Why do you think that countries like the Philippines today are so in love with the rosary? Because of those great missionaries that went out. But you know what ha was ha still happening in Europe? Division. You had Protestantism now going off in so many different directions. Do you know there was a group that wanted to take advantage of this division? Still does. You know what it is? Islam. Mm-hmm. Oh, we can butter this all day long if we want to, but the reality is there's a problem. From the beginning of Islam, you, you can call it a Christian heresy, you can call it whatever you want. They don't believe in Christ as the Messiah, as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Actually, in the Quran, they even say that he was there at the cross, but he came down and some other dude took his place. <laughs> Whack, right? Muhammad did not receive a true revelation. He did not. I know people all follow Calvary. You're such a meanie. Yeah, I know. I'm the last guy that should be doing ecumenism probably, but um, it's the facts, man. Right? I have Islamic friends, so don't think I'm like some Islamophobe or something. I'm just telling you history, man. So they wanted to attack Christianity and destroy it. Read the books. And they were doing it before this. They had great success in, in, in like Constantinople, turned it into Istanbul, right? Greatest... Christian center in the east and so many other places they were trying but they wanted Rome and they saw right now strike they're divided the Pope at the time knew this and who was the Pope a Dominican a dog of God and he was a good one oh he was a good one Pope St. Pius V and you know he didn't just sit back and dialogue about it you know nope he formed a militia an army of men See, that's what a real man does. When those under your care are threatened, what are you going to do, men, if some guy comes to your house with, with, with a gun, you're going to, you know, you're going to sit there and say, let's dialogue about this? No. Shh, shh. <laughs> we can play, right? You have a right to defend. Well, the Pope was defending that which was threatened, the bride of Christ, the church. So he called for a militia, an army. He, he called upon England, come to the defense of, of Christendom. They weren't particularly interested. Matter of fact, they were burning our monasteries, confiscating our property, and killing our nuns. They weren't terribly into it. Uh, Germany, come. 
Yeah, they weren't terribly thrilled about the idea either. Spain, many people came. Certain parts of Italy, like at that time Venice, like its own country, they came and he blessed them and he sent them out. Not to wait for them to come to Rome, go find them. Hmm, those are the days of popes, man. And they went out in rickety ships, unprepared, many of them farmers, they knew what they were doing. And they went and they found this huge naval fleet of, of Muslims in, in a bay in Greece, Lepanto. Everything was against them, the numbers, the skill, even the weather was against them. But they were praying the rosary, the Pope, the confraternities, and they won. And the only reason today that you're not a Muslim and facing towards Mecca when you pray and reading from the Quran is because of what happened on October 7th, 1571, when Western civilization was saved from Islamic takeover. I am not making this up. This is the facts. And what was at the heart of it? The rosary. The rosary, my friends. Oh, if I had the time to tell you, that was the, probably the most famous moment. Do you know how many countries have been saved from communism, socialism, Marxism, and so many other isms? Colombia, the Philippines, this country, that country, Austria, you name it. So many. And yet people today, they just want to dialogue about it, you know? Have a committee meeting and, you know, come on, come on. We're dealing with light and darkness, truth and falsehood, right and wrong. And heaven has given us the weapons that we need. So af after this, in the 16th century, amazing things were happening. In, 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 in the 17th century, I'll tell you one, we as Americans should be so proud of this. In today, what is New Mexico, in 1623, I believe, um, there was a tribe of Humano Indians. They're not even in existence anymore. They were small. Missionaries had not yet arrived in that particular area coming up from Mexico. They had gone to some other areas, but they hadn't arrived in that particular area yet. But when they did, Franciscans in particular, they came across this tribe of Indians who already knew the faith. And guess what they already had? Rosaries. The missionaries were like, okay, who beat us, right? What, what other, what Dominicans or you know, Jesuits beat us here? And they were like, nobody. The lady has been teaching us. The lady? Yes, the lady in blue has been coming to us and teaching us the faith, preparing us, telling us you would be coming, and she gave us these rosaries. I'm not making this up. You can look it up in the historical documents. Now, most of the missionaries back then were from Spain. Not all of them, but most of them. They were, you know, writing this stuff back to Spain in correspondence. They kept phenomenal journals and they were saying, we came across this tribe. No priest has been here. They already know the faith and they're already praying rosaries. What is this? Well, in Spain, there was a notorious mystic named uh, Maria de Agreda, a nun who wore a blue habit, who could bilocate, right? Oh, I'd love to be able to do that, by the way. That'd be sweet, man. I could be surfing in Fiji right now and giving this talk. That'd be awesome. Yeah, Padre Pio wouldn't have done it that way, but I would. So she was bilocating. God was allowing her to go to this people she didn't even know, teaching them the faith, preparing them for the missionaries. And in her convent in Spain, they made rosaries. She took the excess ones and gave them to them. There's a church you can go to in New Mexico where they have this all like Stations of the Cross kind of in the church where you can read all of this from that time as it was written. Amazing, absolutely incredible. So as we move through the, 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 that century and into the next one, even more incredible things are happening. But there's bad things happening as well. There was a group of scholars who were well-intentioned and they did some incredible things, trust me, some really incredible things, but they were Jesuits. <laughs> Come on, I expected a little more, you know? <laughs> Bolandists. They did, they were supposed to like, basically write about the saints and they did a lot of great work with this, for sure. Nobody can deny this. They did some phenomenal research and, and everything. But they began to say that the rosary was a legend. Some of them actually said, well, let's not go that far. Let's say that Our Lady gave it to St. Ignatius, right? You got that whole Dominican thing going on with them, you know? We're better, no, we're better, you know? So. 
they started to have paintings depicting that. Our Lady giving the Rosary to St. Ignatius of Loyola. Rome actually stepped in and said, yeah, no. And they stopped that. But they tried to say that this was something that Our Lady didn't really come then and she didn't really give it to St. Dominic. Hmm, not good. Do you know what heaven's response to that was? Remember Jesus says that it, for, the, for those who don't accept it, even the rocks will cry out. Check this out. In 1754, I believe, again, my dates are maybe off because I haven't given this talk in three years. In Colombia, South America, missionaries had already been there. They'd evangelized the place. Awesome. There was a village where a mother and a daughter, the, the husband was already deceased. The, the, the daughter was sick. I mean, she, she was deaf, mute. She had all kinds of health problems. One day, the mother and the daughter are away from the village gathering stuff, basically like firewood and things. And a storm breaks out, violent storm, and they take refuge in a cliff. And almost like a little grotto, kind of. And when they're there, they both see a beautiful woman, exquisitely beautiful, holding a child. And they had been catechized. They were Catholic. So they were like, they knew who it was. No words were said but they knew who it was. The little girl couldn't formulate anything anyway. She couldn't speak. They went back to the village and the mother, she wanted to tell people, but she thought they're gonna think she's crazy saying that she saw uh, Mary and, and the child Jesus. So she didn't say anything, but they kept going back there to pray. Never saw it again. Then not too long after that, the girl, cause she was so sick, she died dead. In the village, they are preparing the funeral they're about to celebrate the funeral mass. You know what the mother did? In a panic, in grief, she picked up her dead daughter. Everybody saw this, ran out of the village. People didn't know where she was going. They didn't know what had happened. They thought she's just having a moment, right? She goes to the rock cliff. She prays for her little girl. And the little girl comes back to life. Now she can speak, she can hear. They go back to the village and they give testimony to what had happened and what they had seen before. And the whole village goes to the rock cliff. And when they get there, they see something on the cliff that hadn't been there before. Life size, as big as you and me. Who is it? It's Our Lady holding the Christ child. On their sides are Saint Dominic. Our Lady is giving the rosary to Saint Dominic. The rocks will cry out if you deny this. And our Lord, as a child, is giving the Franciscan cord that they wear as part of their habit to St. Francis. The priests, a little slow in getting there, they show up and they're like, whoa, this is amazing. Who painted this? Everybody was asking this. And the mother and daughter, we'd never seen this before. This is a spot where we saw Our Lady, but this is new. This wasn't here. We've never seen this. People being people, they began to, to, to try and see what it is. They began to take pieces of it. Right? I probably would have done the same thing, <laughs> you know? Take a little piece of it home, a little, a little relic from this place, you know? But the fascinating thing is, the color was still there. Even though it was a little deeper, it's still there. Interesting. Some people being people, probably teenagers or something, this is probably something stupid I would have done back in the day too. They tried to rub it and smear it. It didn't smear. What kind of pigment is this? What, what is this? Fascinating. Eventually, People came and bored into the cliff, three feet deep, took out a core sample. Do you know what's amazing? It's not paint. It's the rock. It's the rock. This is impossible. And that's not something, you know, I have people come up to me all the time with a picture of a cloud. They're like, Father, do you see it? And I'm like, I don't see nothing, Jack, but if it's a gift for you. It's a gift for you, you know. It's a bug, homie. It flew in front of the camera, you know. But I don't want to ruin your day. So, yeah, it's amazing. You know, I don't know. But this is not one of those things. This is like a life-size, beautiful. Look it up on Google, man. 1754 this happened. Do you know that this is fully approved? It's a minor basilica. John Paul II talked about it during his pontificate. Our Lady of Las Lajas in Colombia. Mind-blowing. In my opinion, it's just one step below Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is miraculous. As Scott Hahn says, Our Lady of Guadalupe is like Our Lady took a selfie and left it in Mexico City, right? <laughs> yep, that's true. But the rocks cried out in Colombia because people were starting to deny the rosary tradition. So God put it into a rock. It's still there. 
I want to go there someday. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't want to die. Colombia is a little sketchy, but you actually have to fly into Ecuador and you go over that way. It's, it's, it's really remote in, in Colombia. I've known people that have gone there. It looks like Lord of the Rings. The, 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 the minor basilica is over this huge canyon, but it's there. It's absolutely mind blowing. What, what, what happened after that? Well, some more incredible things. Our lady came to a little town in France, not far from where the rosary was given in the 13th century to a little girl, humble, simple little girl named Bernadette Subiru in an apparition. And what did Our Lady have in her hands? The rosary. Matter of fact, she prayed parts of it with Bernadette Subiru. You can't get no greater endorsement for the rosary than when the Holy Mother of God prays it. The parts that she can. She doesn't pray for forgive us our sins and the Our Father and such. She's not a sinner. She doesn't pray for her own intercession. That'd be all jacked up. But she prayed the parts she could with Bernadette. And a rosary revolution began. And why did that happen? Because there was another revolution right before that in France, the battleground of the rosary, where it was given the French Revolution. You know, it amazes me today how many people celebrate the French Revolution. Again, are you high? Do you know what the French Revolution did to the Catholic Church? Do you know to this day, the churches in, in France are not owned by the Catholic Church? That's why when, when Notre Dame was burning, which mean, doesn't mean football, by the way, it means Our Lady. Please understand that. So when it burned a couple years ago, isn't it fascinating that the government is the people talking about built, rebuilding it? Yeah, because they own it. Thanks to the French Revolution. Well, they were lit. What, what lunatics take nuns to a guillotine? That's what the leaders of the French Revolution did. Uh-huh. And then you know what else they did? The leaders of the French Revolution marched into the Cathedral of Notre Dame, the one that burned a few years ago. They brought a prostitute in, not making it up. They put her on the altar half naked and they chanted something to her. You know what they said? Hail goddess full of reason, they said. You sick, twisted perverts. That's what they did. Mocking the Hail Mary. Hail Mary full of grace. Wicked men replace it with hail goddess full of reason. That's the leaders of the French Revolution. There was a man who shortly before that wrote the greatest book ever on the rosary, the secret of the rosary. But like most of his other works, it was buried in a field in France for like 150 years. Unfortunate, but we should be grateful because had the revolutionaries found it, they would have burned it and we wouldn't have it today. God hid it in a field. For later times. You're going to need this later. When Our Lady came against that French Revolution to little Bernadette Subiru, she brought the rosary and she prayed it. And the whole world, a rosary revolution started. And then we had a Pope, Leo XIII, who wrote 11 encyclicals on the rosary. Are you kidding me? No Pope has wrote on one topic so many encyclicals. That's off the charts. That's just encyclicals. He wrote papal letters. He wrote this. He did that. He did so many things to the rosary. Nobody compares to him. Why that man is not canonized blows my mind. Blows my mind. Leo the 13th. Amazing. 20th century, the snowball just keeps going. We get so many more incredible things happening with the rosary. Our Lady of Fatima comes. All kind of apparitions. I won't tell you anything weird or unapproved. Fatima. You get Coapa, Nicaragua. Look this stuff up. It's in my book. I did all the research for you. In, in, in Cabejo, when two tribes are going at it with, 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 with shetties, Our Lady comes to promote the regular rosary and also the Seven Sorrows rosary. Our Lady of San Nicolas in Argentina. So many, Bano, Burang, approved apparitions. Akita, Japan, and what's the main theme? The rosary. The rosary. And yet we're so stiff-necked and stubborn, we don't listen. We think we can dialogue our way out of this and committee it, you know, strategic planning programs. You know what your strategic program, planning program should be? A holy hour before the Eucharist with the weapon in hand. This is how you win the victories. You can conquer nations this way. You don't need super educated, wasting time and money and resources. Get on your knees and do battle.
This is what heaven has been telling us for so long. And now, in recent times, Saint, with the pontificate of St. John Paul II, you know, it's fascinating that during the 60s and 70s, you know that there were seminaries that told the seminarians, you can't pray the rosary in the chapel. What kind of insanity is that? That's like sending men to boot camp and saying, yeah, we're not going to give you a gun. <laughs> you're there to learn to be warriors. You're cranking out new recruits and you're not going to give them this weapon. It was discouraged. I've heard this from older priests who have told me, yeah, we couldn't do that in the seminary. We couldn't pray the rosary. That's nuts. No wonder we had so many problems, jacked up palaces, turning into pink palaces and seminaries. No wonder you get rid of the women that men want to fight for, a queen. They're going to they're gonna be jacked up in their emotions. They're going to be seeking out other things. And unfortunately, even other dudes. What the heck? This ain't rocket science. No wonder things are so jacked up today. Men need a beauty to fight for. You take that beauty out, they're all confused. They become defectors in battle. And then they don't even think that there is a dragon. What dragon? Nah. That's why we're living in such messed up times. Then when John Paul II became the Pope, one of the first things that he said in his pontificate, the whole world heard it. Most traveled Pope in history. The rosary is my favorite prayer, he said. Wow, that's amazing. A lot of people were definitely triggered that day when he said that, but he began to promote it everywhere. And he gave as a gift that you could give to the newlyweds who came to Rome to get the blessing of the Pope. What did he give them? Rosary. Promoted it everywhere that he went. At the World Youth Days, at this meeting, at that meeting, told bishops to promote it, do it. Wow. And then, knowing the seriousness of the times, he gave us the option. Now don't freak, because I meet a lot of people, they freak out, they're like, Oh, I'm, I'm a hardcore traditionalist, so I don't pray the luminous mysteries. You're a dork. <laughs> Do you really think that our Lord is offended by this option? It's not obligatory. But why would you slam it? Do you not realize what's going on in modern times? Stuff that wasn't happening when the original mysteries were given to St. Dominic that he had to combat with his preaching and praying method that worked. Let's, let's take a little journey through them, shall we? Think about, about the first luminous mystery. And basically, by the way, all that St. John Paul II did was to, to update the weapon and turn the, the, the sword into a light saber. The luminous mysteries for dark times, right? That's what he did. Think about the first luminous mystery. The baptism of Jesus. Why? Why? Of all the things will we meditate upon this? How many people don't have their kids baptized today? So many. I meet parents. Oh, they got their PhD from this school and that school. And they say, oh, no, I don't want to you know, impose that on my child. I'll wait till they grow up to make that decision on their own. Stupid. You, do you not feed your children? What's going to happen if you don't feed your children? You, you just going to wait for them to do it on their own? They're dead. You have a responsibility to feed their bodies. You also have a responsibility to feed their souls. This is the gateway into the mysteries, into the sacraments, into grace. How many parents don't baptize their kids? So many. We need this sacrament. How about the second luminous mystery? This is a zinger right here. Don't walk out on me now. The wedding feast of Cana. Of all the things that we can meditate upon, why? Why? Because today marriage is under attack. Marriage has been redefined by so many cultures. Today we think it's legit for two dudes to get married or two women to get married. This is an offense against God. Look, we're all disordered. I got my cross, you got yours. But there's right and there's wrong. There's truth and there's falsehood. This is wrong, very wrong. This wasn't under attack in the 13th century. Even the heretics knew this one. But today we're so messed up, we think it's normal. Modern family, right? We entertain ourselves with this nonsense. The education system today basically is one gigantic indoctrination camp, educating your children to be all favorable to this. Ay, ay, ay. I used to love the month of June. Now I can't stand it. It's my birth month. Everywhere I go, I just see rainbows. This is wrong. See, why did he go to the wedding feast of Cana? 
Because Jesus is only present at a wedding that's between a man and a woman, my friends. We've so distorted this, so jacked it up, that even many of you probably here today bought into it. It ain't right. When you pray that mystery that decade, you need to be making reparation. You need to be converting your heart into the truth on this matter. It doesn't mean we're haters. I have relatives who suffer from same-sex attraction. I love them. I don't hate them. I'm not a homophobe. But there's right and there's wrong. There's truth and there's falsehood. There's light and there's darkness. We need the light of Christ to shine strongly. This is the building block of civilization, marriage and family. You know, at Fatima, Sister Lucia dos Santos, the longest lived visionary, the one who got the short end of that stick, right? The others died and are already canonized. She lived to be 100 and she ain't nothing. <laughs> you know, She's like, what about me? Um, she'll get it one day, hopefully. So she said to a cardinal, when she was a nun in Portugal, the final battle between good and evil will be fought over trees? <laughs> no. Immigration? No. Marriage and family. Hello? We're living it. We got to unsheathe the sword. We got to take up the weapon, converting our own hearts. The third one. What's the third? Oh, conversion. Hello. The proclamation of the kingdom and the call to conversion. How many people today just think that Jesus is a guru? Oh, it's, you know, we all go to heaven. He's the same as Muhammad, God forbid, or, 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 or you know, Buddha. Or some dude in Sedona, Arizona, putting a hot rock on his belly button, searching for nirvana and... Stupid. He ain't a guru. He's the son of God. He's not an option. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. That's not Father Calloway. That's Christianity. That's everything. And yet this is not taught in schools. This is not even taught in many Catholic schools. This needs to be changed. The fourth mystery, the institution of the Eucharist, or no, transfiguration. Again, many people just see Jesus as an option. He's just one of many, nothing special. No, his light shone so bright they could hardly behold it. He is the son of God, he is God. That is so important today. Today you can go to many Catholic schools, they don't even have a theology department, they have religious studies. Why? Because theology is faith, you know, seeking, uh, understanding, what's the definition of it? I forget it. Faith seeking understanding. That's theology. So if you don't have faith, you don't need to have a theology department. You can practice religious pluralism. Seriously. Go to many schools and you'll find books on Jesus that are usually whack. And then you'll find other stuff in all the other religions. It's like they're proud of trying to get rid of Jesus and be so sensitive to everybody else that they don't even want to have crucifixes in Catholic universities. What insanity is this? We've lost it. We need to bring them back. And then the last mystery. Oh, this is so important. The institution of the Eucharist. What was it? Right before the pandemic, a survey, a study was taken in North America. It's probably the same around the world. 69% of Catholics do not believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. 69%, you might as well round it up, 70%. What the heck? What happened? How, how did this happen? Well, it's easy to see. The preaching, garbage. It's not about your dog father. It's not about your golf game father. People come to church once a week Preach. Tell them. And if you tick them off and they walk away, fine. Jesus himself said 2,000 years ago, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. And there was a group of dudes who said, yeah, that's a hard saying. We're out of here. And what did Jesus say to them? Oh, I'm sorry. Come back. Kumbaya, group hug. Did I offend you? Come on. Come on. Right? Let's dialogue. No. He let them walk away. Why? Because he's mean, nasty Jesus, he's a hater. No, because he loves them so much that he knows truth doesn't change for your convenience. It doesn't tickle your ear. Because when you go through your crisis, and you will, you will know where you can come back where truth doesn't change. Really, this is Catholicism. It's not a fad, by the way. It's the truth. 
unchanging like Jesus yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Always the same. This is the Eucharist. It is Jesus. We've got to recapture this. When we pray that decade, we've got to stir up that Eucharistic love. We've got to turn our, our churches back into places that, that love him, honor him, reverence him. We've got to take those tabernacles from out in the hallway down the closet. No wonder people don't know how to genuflect. Bring them back. It ain't our house either. It's his house. How dare we kick him out of the sanctuary? All oh, these liturgists, they worry me. We got problems, folks. We got problems. These mysteries are a gift to us. Don't be afraid to pray them. You're not obliged. It's not an obligatory. Okay, fine. But don't slam anybody who does. We need to make reparations to, to our Lord's heart, to our Lady's heart, because they're very much offended today. Very much offended today. So I'm going to challenge you. If you don't own a rosary, shame on you. No, well, yeah. <laughs> You're Catholic, man. What are you doing? If it's just on your rear view mirror, don't think you're somebody special because you got one hanging in your car. You need to pray it. You need to use it. You need to unsheathe the sword. Will it help you? Oh yes. Oh yes. Our Lady has said the rosary can change human history. It can stop wars. I could tell you what else it does. It heals men from the thing that is plaguing the planet right more, way more than COVID. That kills your body, maybe, maybe. Your soul. Pornography. Numero uno among the sins of men today. Trust me, I'm a priest. I hear confessions. I know. With the rosary, you can replace those images that have helped you to go astray and fall into mortal sin with holy images. Your mind, your heart, your intentions become good. You can have a chaste heart like St. Joseph. You can become a knight of the Immaculata. You can become a member of Our Lady's Army. This is what we need today among men. Boys by the age of nine are being exposed to hardcore pornography today. How do we conquer this beast? We need fathers, men to step up and to hand these things on to their boys, to their daughters as well, of course, but that's a whole different talk. I remember when my biological father died, he gave me his 22. Not a powerful gun, right? But he gave it to me. I'm not getting rid of it. My dad gave me this. What if fathers began to give their boys their rosary? Or get them a rosary? A manly one, not a pink one, right? Get them a manly one. Son, this is the rosary. When I met your mother, this is the one that I used. Or if you jacked it up at the beginning of your marriage, son, when I had my conversion, this rosary has helped me so much. I know I haven't maybe always been the best father. My mistakes are many and I'm sorry. I give this to you. That boy ain't gonna get rid of it. It means something. We need men to step up today to take up this weapon of warfare for yourself. For your family because there is a dragon who wants to devour your bride and your children breathing fire really and for our country Pope Leo XIII said that the praying of the rosary heals the 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 things that are ailing society and it's true we need to take it up my friends so I offer you a challenge pray it pray it every day one set of mysteries to pray it well takes about 20 minutes. Don't rush, slow down. Remember, the stop sign says speed kills. Don't fly through it. I've been to churches where, you know, God bless them, ladies are praying the rosary before or after mass, but it's like sold to the highest bidder. It's like, slow down, grandma, dag, gone, man, you know? <laughs> What's the rush? Oh, then you've got other people who are like molasses. Hail Mary. It's like, bro, what's wrong? Are you, are you on your meds? Are you off your meds? What's up, right? <laughs> Normal, be normal in the pace that you set so that you can pray it as one voice. Because I can tell you, it's tough to pray it when somebody's speeding ahead or somebody's like molasses. I just want to get it done at that point. It's torture. Learn to pray it as one at the common pace. It's powerful stuff, man. 20 minutes a day. How many of you don't raise your hand? You waste more time on social media and Facebook. You spend more time. Yeah, you did, right? Yeah, I know. 
you, 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 you're in the toilet for more than 20 minutes sometimes. Can you not offer to God and Our Lady 20 minutes of your day? Walking your dog, you can do it, okay? If you got a, a, a driving lawnmower, you can do it then, right? You got convenience. You don't have to necessarily have a, a rosary like I showed you, though that's the best option, but there's rosary rings. Heck, you got 10 digits. God made one on your body, okay? There's no excuse for you. This will transform your life. It'll get the poison of sin out of your life. I know. It did it for me 28 years ago, and it still does it for me. Still does it for me. Been a priest 18 years now. When I don't pray my rosary, I suck. I really do. I'm grumpy. I got like a, I'm a chip on my shoulder. I'm like, you know, I'm, just, I'm in a fighting mood. You know, it's kind of me normal, but you know what I mean? Like, I'm just irritable. Not where I need to be. And do not all the saints say this? Even the ones who struggle with the rosary, as we all do. Look, I'm gonna tell you right now, I've written five books on the rosary. I have never prayed a perfect rosary. I don't think anybody has, but Padre Pio, probably. Everybody gets distracted. You're not, you don't have angelic mind. You can't pinpoint on one thing for 20 minutes and there's nothing else going on. No, you're gonna be thinking about that smell. Did I respond to that fate message? Did I this, that, and the other? What's for dinner? Normal. Normal. St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower. Everybody loved little Therese, right? She really struggled to pray the rosary. She talks about it in her story of a soul. But she didn't stop. Love perseveres. Don't matter how you feel. Many times I pray the rosary, I ain't feeling nothing. Love perseveres. I love you. Because when you're saying those Hail Marys, as Fulton Sheen said, you're saying to God and to Our Lady, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And they never get tired of hearing this. And even if it's, it's a scattered I love you, it's like butterfly kisses from a child to a parent. All distracted is all get out. But God will take it. Don't become discouraged because you can't focus. You can do this. If you struggle for 20 minutes, look, God is so good to you. He gave you the rosary on training wheels, the chaplet of divine mercy. It takes five, okay? Five minutes. God's like, gosh, man, you guys are so out of it. Here, try this. I'll give you training wheels. Build up to it. You can do this. If you don't know how to pray it, it's simple, guys. Go online. It's so easy to learn. As your brother and as a priest, I challenge you to this. And watch what will happen for you. Watch what will happen to you. You'll see your life start to change. The things that you used to want to entertain yourself with, the foul, disgusting, perverse sitcoms and so forth, you will, your soul will be repulsed by these things. The way that your eyes look, the things you're doing to women with your eyes and your intentions and in your heart, oh, it's a struggle, for sure. But you will be better. You can become a good man. You can become so good that you will be responding to that call to holiness for your family, for your wife, for your children, for your workplace, for your parish, for your country. We need good men today. So, I'm gonna pray for you. I know many of my words have been very strong and you're probably thinking, this dude's nuts. That's cool. I don't care. I'm here to save your soul and to tell you the truth. And I know it can sting, but nobody catches a fish with a dull hook, my friends. Mm -mm. Nope. I put that in you today, the hook. You can fight. You can struggle, that's fine, I'm a fisherman. You can go away from the boat, go deep as you think you wanna go. We got lots of line. You ain't going nowhere, this lake is only so big. Mm -hmm. Lots of mercy. Oh, you wore yourself out? Great, flip over the level, reel you in. You didn't need to fight all these decades, my friend. You need to be praying these decades. You need to be praying this rosary. If you struggle from a particular vice, lust, anger, greed, whatever it may be, Take it to the rosary and watch your life be transformed. What woman would not want a man like this? What daughter would not delight in seeing a father on his knees leading the rosary for the family? Every girl's heart longs for this kind of warrior. A man who's sure, strong, and you may lay asphalt in your job during the day, that's great. But are you displaying that strength for those who need your protection and defense 
in the home? Are you the one taking your family to church? Don't leave it up to your wife. Remember about the Holy Family. Jesus, who's God, Mary, the Immaculata, Joseph, he's the bottom. He's the least holy of them. And yet it was his role to lead the prayers in the family. It was not the role of Jesus. It was not the role of Our Lady. It was his role. And he did it. Knowing that they were better at it. Because I meet a lot of men, they'll say, my wife does it better. Buddy, that's not the point. You're probably right. We men suck. But it's your responsibility as the head of your family to lead in the practice of your faith. Studies have been done. Sociological studies. When it's only the mother, the wife who leads the prayers, there's a very high percentage of those kids when they leave home, they don't continue with the practice of the faith. That was just mom. But when dad does it, exponentially it shoots up. Because there's something there. Something hardwired into us from God. And we need to get back to this. All right, so today I have bad news. I live in Steubenville, Ohio, but my religious community's headquarters are in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. So right up the road, more or less. They didn't send my books on the rosary, right? But they did send tons of the consecration to St. Joseph. So I'll be signing and selling these books if you want to get one of these. I apologize that they didn't send the correct book, but no worries. Um, you can get, get those as well. So pray the rosary, get the books. The world, your wife, your children, they need you, brothers. God bless you guys. Thank you.